I don't know if you have noticed your own study or in the listening of the word from Romans 1 to Romans 7, the Holy Spirit is mentioned only twice. But here, Romans 8, he is meant, referred to 22 times. And while we have a decisive deliverance from sin's power through the cross of Christ in Romans 6, and a final deliverance from the frustrating futility from sin working in us in Romans 7, we now have a freeing liberation through the work of the Spirit as we walk in the Spirit. F. F. Bruce wrote, there is no reason why those who are in Christ Jesus should go on doing penal servitude as though they had never been pardoned and never been liberated from the prison house of sin. Romans 8 shows us how we are to live in the freedom and the power of God's Spirit while yet groaning and suffering. And while we walk In the spirit, we do so yet still in this world until Jesus comes. And so we will begin with thinking about the ministry of God's spirit. He indwells us and enables us. He assures us of our sonship and he brings to our experience all the promises and privileges of the new covenant. We now have a present enabling that enables godly living. The fundamental contrast in this whole passage is between our inability and weakness on one hand and that of the law to renew and reorder life so long as sin is in control and contrasted to the effectual life-giving power of God's own presence in the Spirit On the other hand, the outcome is to open the way for the fulfillment of God's holy and just commandment in life and living. So godly living begins with the truth that there is no condemnation for us and ends with our own personal testimony that there is no one to condemn us. The Spirit dwells us to change us by God's righteousness, verses 1 to 8. Listen now to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Let me do that again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for the sake of sin, for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but we... Um, But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the Spirit, for the mind that is set on the Spirit, um, on the flesh, is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, and indeed it cannot. Those who are in flesh cannot please God. And so God, the Spirit then, God's Spirit changes us because of spiritual realities. Verses 1 to 4. Who we are in Christ, we who are in Christ are not condemned. Why? 
Well, because the law of the spirit of life set us free from the law of sin and death. And what does he mean by this? He explains it in the next verse. The law of sin and death is this. Weakened by the flesh, the law could not bring nor produce righteousness with the consequence that we are controlled by sin and condemned to death. That's the law of sin and death. The law was righteous and holy, but it could not produce what it described with the end result that we were condemned under the law. But the law of the spirit of life is this. God sent Jesus into human body, into the realm of the flesh, to condemn sin and to complete the law for us. So the law of the spirit of life is this. Jesus did it for us. He fulfilled the law. He stood under its condemnation, though he did not deserve it, on our behalf. And he suffered the just penalty of the law. As believers in Christ, we are free from condemnation because Jesus Christ has completely fulfilled the law on our behalf. He became what we are, weak, human, subject to sin's power, that we might become what he is, righteous, holy, and alive. God's Spirit also changes us through our spiritual practice, verses 5 to 8. What God has done in Christ, he makes true in us. Those who have been set free from sin's domination to the Spirit's control are those who do walk according to the Spirit. They are characterized by how they live. They live the way they do because of their mindset, because of the way you think. Now, this is just generally true. You live out the way you think, even if you're not really aware of the way you think. But certainly, Paul points to the fact that if we have certain kind of thinking, certain kind of mindset, it is going to manifest itself in the way we live. Through these contrasts, Paul explains why it is that the Spirit and not the flesh, brings life. People in the flesh, that is, who live in the old regime, where sin and death reign, have mindsets dominated by ungodly impulses, verse 5. They cannot submit to God's law, verse 7, and therefore ultimately cannot please God, verse 8. Rather, They are under the sentence of death, verse 6. On the other hand, Christians in the spirit who have been transferred into the new realm, the new regime, where grace and righteousness reign, and who have therefore been given a new mindset, focused on the spirit, enjoy life and peace. And so we who are placed into Christ have received from God the indwelling of the Spirit who is in us a new heart. We are given a new inner person and therefore a new capacity to think biblically and um, that with which to think. And here is the primary function of the Spirit in practical terms of changing us. He gives us a new mindset, a new way of thinking. He is in the process of renewing our mind, as Paul says in other places, with the effect that it transforms us. If you live out the way you think, then the Spirit is changing the way you think, so you'll live it out. Do you see? Notice those who mind the flesh then live according to the flesh, are hostile to God, do not and cannot submit to God's law, do not please God, all this is the realm of death, the realm of judgment. Now the Spirit is also in us, not only 
to change us by God's righteousness, but also to indwell us as God's life. Picking up in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now notice that the Spirit first is in us. If the Spirit is in us, then we are in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Paul has this interesting sort of way of saying this. The Spirit comes in us with the effect that we are in the Spirit. All of those who are in Christ have the Holy Spirit in them. It is the Spirit's work to take the promises of the Scripture and the work that Christ has done and to apply it to us. He does this by indwelling us and therefore giving us the life of God in our souls. He does this by placing us in Christ. And all who are in Christ have applied to them all that Jesus has accomplished. Therefore... We are dead to sin, and we are alive in Christ. Yet, as we've said in Romans 6 and 7, we live in this world as this kind of people until the Lord comes. We live in the overlap of those two realms. Now, those who are in Christ will be characterized by life, the life of Christ, The indwelling of the Spirit imparts the character of Christ so that we will live out the righteousness of Christ in our lives. Further, this life is God's gift by the Spirit as opposed to sin's wages of death and judgment. Now let let me pause. I know a lot of this sounds new and different and maybe a little strange, it's too deep, I don't know what you're talking about. But one of the things that Paul is doing here is he's teaching us the way to think as Christians about who we are and what he has done and how what he has done is applied to us. To invent other ways of trying to live the Christian life will eventually fail. And so while some of this sounds difficult and some of this sounds esoteric, it's great theology, but tomorrow, what do I do about X? (laughs) Whatever that may be. Well, what you do about that temptation, that provocation, that situation, how you respond to it will be governed by the way you think. In your beliefs and in your desires. And so the fundamental question that Paul is answering is, are you going to think primarily in the flesh, in the world, under law, like you used to, Or are you going to live out and think in the power of the Spirit and the life of the Spirit and the new heart, the new person that you really are? Which are you going to do? Now, we can answer that generally in the big picture, but it actually gets answered in the moment in which we're tempted to lie. Or we're tempted to take something not our own. We're tempted to cover sin. See what I'm saying? 
So while this sounds way up there, it's actually right down here. Will you walk, live, moment by moment in that realm like that kind of person? Or are you going to live in this realm like this kind of person? The law can't help you there. It merely condemns you. But the Spirit who dwells in you dwells in you for the very purpose of causing you and enabling you to live this life. So, we are therefore in the Spirit. This is another way that Paul identifies the new realm, the new creation. The new creation is marked by life and by Spirit. It is an immersion into the blessed life of God just as we were immersed in water at baptism. In these verses, the words life and death are also meant to convey blessing and judgment. I started to put a whole section here to show you that from the Old Testament. How life equals blessing and death equals judgment all through the Old Testament. So these concepts are coming to us in the New Testament. It's not merely being alive or being dead, but it's in and of itself a place in which God blesses us or God condemns us and judges us. See? The body is dead, not that it's inanimate, but that it is corrupted and condemned. It is mortal. It is a part of this world. But we have God's approval and right standing before him characterized by the word life. So the present possession of spiritual life in dying in mortal bodies anticipates the possession of spiritual life in a living and glorified body in the resurrection. So we have a mortal body now that's part of this world and we have in us the living spirit that's a part of that world. So the spirit indwells this mortal dying body until the day we either die and the Lord returns or the Lord returns and we receive a new creation body that's like this but different, 1 Corinthians 15. And then this realm will be all there is because this realm will have finally and fully passed away. So the Spirit is in us, and we are in the Spirit, and Christ is in us. Notice that then Christ is in us by the Spirit. Now, think about this carefully, because the second person of the Godhead sits at the right hand of God in heaven, frankly, in a glorified body. So what does it mean for Jesus to be in us, for Christ to be in us? The Spirit indwells us in such a way and is so completely the person and character of Christ that if you could see the Spirit, what you would see, actually who you would see, is Jesus. He is an independent person in the Godhead, but he is the mirror image of Jesus Christ. And so his presence in us is so much Jesus, like Jesus, that it is actually Jesus in us. This is the way he speaks of this. Now this is more than what comes out in Romans 8. So while maintaining the uniqueness of each person, Paul underscores the unity of the Godhead. The Father sent the Son to do what those who were in the Spirit needed, verses 3 to 4. And now the Spirit is in us as an extension of the Son. Now here we are called by faithfulness to the Scriptures to hold in tension two very clear truths. That the indwelling of the Spirit infallibly secures life eternal for us. And that a life empowered by and patterned after God's Spirit is utterly necessary to inherit eternal life. You need to be holy to have eternal life. The Holy Spirit living in you guarantees that holiness. See it? The Spirit is given to empower 
our activity in righteousness. So we do not owe the flesh anything. Sin has its wages, its cost. Sin tries to enslave us as means of debt, but it is operating over there in that sphere of death. But we are now in life, with life in us. Sin no longer owns us. Sin no longer contractually holds us. So we put to death what has already died and live the life we already have. See, this is the, this is the Pauline logic of the Christian life. You must become who you are. You must live what life you already have. You must put to death what is already dead. Why is that? Because we live in between those two realms. We live where they overlap. So you are dead, so put to death that which is from here, you see. So our little simple books on the keys to the Christian life... (laughs) You know, which go from the esoteric up here all the way down to carry a picture of Jesus around in your pocket, probably are unhelpful in the long run. Oh, they might have momentary blessing and, you know, a sort of... But at the end of the day, you need to learn to master and to live according to these principles. Well, the Holy Spirit is also in us to assure us as God's sons, verses 14 to 17. Since this is so, we have both an obligation, a new obligation, and a new identity. Listen to what he says, verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, our Papa, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The Holy Spirit is in us to assure us of God's sons, first, of our relationship as his children. We are obligated in how we live. We are not to live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Why? Because the law tells us to? No. Because the ministry is to assure us that we are God's son. You will live out your identity. More practically, you will live out who you think you are. If you are constantly thinking that you are this kind of person, guess what will happen? You'll live that kind of life. Rather, you take on your identity as a son of God, as a Christian, as one indwelt by the Spirit, as one with a new life, a new heart, a new way of thinking then you will begin to live this out. And so the ministry of the Spirit then is to assure us of our identity. The being led by the Spirit is not in terms of making personal decisions. That is not what Paul's... Why why in the world would he drop that here? Everyone who makes their decisions by the Spirit's leading are truly God's children. That is not what Paul is talking about. Rather, he's talking about being under the Spirit's control. The sense here is not that we make personal decisions, but rather the sense that the Holy Spirit indwelling in us now controls us. Those whom the Spirit controls, he helps to recognize their sonship and bears witness in them that they are God's Son. He therefore functions as the Spirit who makes our sonship real to us. Adoption is here not the idea of being brought into the family, because we're born in the family, right? But that of being recognized as sons. So Jesus is publicly acknowledged as God's true son, and he responds with these words of intimacy Abba, Father. In the garden, Mark 14, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but your will be done. 
And this term also points to God, people who are his sons and daughters, graciously chosen by him according to his good purposes. We're born into the family, and then we, by the Spirit, are being both publicly and personally affirmed to be his children. And so the Spirit is in us to assure us of our relationship to God. He is also in us to assure us of our standing as sons. Our adoption into God's family, however amazing and comforting, is not the end of the story. For to be children is also to be heirs. To be still waiting for the full bestowment of all the rights and privileges that have been conferred on us as God's children. So we are a part of that realm, we're in the family, we're part of that kingdom, but we don't have all that yet. Particularly, what do we not have yet? A new body, right? We have not been delivered from sinfulness. We're not delivered from the curse yet. Just as the Son of God had to suffer before entering into his glory, so we sons of God by adoption must also suffer with him before sharing in his glory. Because we are joined to Christ, the servant of the Lord, despised and rejected by men, we can expect the path to our glorious inheritance to be strewn with difficulties and dangers. That's a quote from Don Carson. So, verse 17 then is a transition from verses 1 to 16 to verses 18 to 30, we have this amazing privilege and glorious reality of being God's sons and thus his heirs. Yet, yet, we must suffer now. For if we suffer now, we will be glorified later. Let me wrap this up. After all the more difficult to understand principles and precepts of Romans 5 to 7, we are not brought to a simple resolution. We now live as the sons and daughters of God by the Spirit. We are not in the flesh. We are not under the old covenant law. What does this mean? What are the practical implications Listen to just a few of these paragraphs from the NLT. Brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your old sinful person urges you to do. For if you live by and you submit to its dictates, you will end up being judged in death. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death what your old sinful self wants to do, you will, in fact, really live. For all who are led and are submitted to the Spirit of God are the true children of God. Therefore, know this. You have not received a kind of spirit that turns you into spherical slaves. Instead, you have received God's Spirit when the Lord adopted you to recognize you as his own children. Now therefore, through the Spirit, we recognize God, not as a judge administering law, but as a dear and precious Father. What does the Spirit do in our lives that is so important? He is changing us by his power to become more and more like Christ. He is residing in us as the very life of God in our souls. He is assuring us of our relationship and standing as the children and sons of God. So, are you still enslaved to sin and law so that you are fearful of God's wrath? Are you living, I mean really living, the life and power in the Spirit, by the Spirit? Do you now have a sense of reality, recognizing God as your loving Father? Are you willing to embrace these truths in this light, provided we suffer with Him 
in order that we may be also glorified with him. The path to glory is the path of suffering. The last half of Romans 8. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your spirit who is in us, our Lord Jesus Christ, who empowers us to live the new life who gives us a new capacity to think your thoughts after you, who gives us the mind of Christ, who gives us life, who brings to us in this old mortal body the inward reality of the new creation that is to come, who leads us so that we are assured that we are your sons. Thank you for the Spirit. May we live as people who have the Spirit in us, who are in the Spirit, and who are receiving this enabling ministry of the Spirit.